We have two more speakers who, spent, uh, who sent us uh, a video message, and we'll go into those very quickly. The first one is Sergei Postopolsky, and Sergei did his master's at the University of Michigan, and he has done 54 continuous years of work on osprey and bald eagles in Wisconsin. I've been looking very much uh, to take part in the, this uh, anniversary observation to uh, connect again with uh, my old colleagues and meet some new ones at the conference. Unfortunately, my uh, health issues won't allow my participation as I am in the hospital right now. I must say that I felt somewhat out of place to be invited to a Peregrine Falcon Conference, a species that was declining at the time and was cause for much concern because my total experience with that species at that point consisted of having seen a wintering individual once in South Florida. However, the conference also covered uh, other birds of prey that were declining at the time. So that's how I got invited. Because at that point in 1965, I had already completed five annual nesting surveys of bald eagles in Michigan. And that information was available to Sandy Sprunt, who, and it would have been covered uh, in his report on the uh, bald eagle uh, uh, for the whole country. At that time, I also had completed the first statewide nesting survey for ospreys. And uh, I had also done partial surveys in part of the state in the northern lower peninsula and some in the upper peninsula for ospreys, but not a complete survey that would include it, uh, uh, the outcome of nesting and so forth. So the, the whole conference served to uh, call attention to the decline of birds of prey at that time, not only in uh, North America, but also in Europe on both sides of the Atlantic. So that was the significance of, of the conference and it has helped stimulate research uh, for the next several decades. Hey, hey, G, can I just mention something that he mentioned there? That conference, in fact, did stimulate research. In fact, I think it was the year after Dan Berger and, and Jim Anderson went down the Mackenzie. Was it the year after the conference you guys went down the Mackenzie? I'm not hearing him. Was it the year after the conference that you guys went down the Mackenzie, you and Jim? The Mackenzie River? When did you go down the Mackenzie River? When did we? Yeah, you and Jim. Go down the Mackenzie River. Oh, that was uh, 1965. <laughs> Six, I think. No. Yeah. No, no, no. It was after the conference. 66. Yeah. Uh, and, that, and you see, we had no data from the United States or from North America. On, uh, we, had no we had no baseline. We had no data in Peregrine Falcon for the DT. And that conference stimulated a trip that Dan Berger and Jim Anderson took down the Mackenzie and that John Ha and I made on the Yukon River. We found 18 pairs on the Yukon. In fact, uh, part of that was stimulated because Joe had heard from uh, a young falconer that he had just been on the Yukon River between Eagle and Circle, that's about 150 miles, and he found something like three pairs all. Uh, Tom, was, Tom Cade was there in 51, and he found 18 pair, and John Ha and I found 18 pair. And so uh, we, part of the things we had to do were to take eggs because in those days the way you looked at pesticides was either with pectoral muscle and brain and gonad or blood and eggs. 
uh, that was a, a real test of my professionalism to have to take peregrine falcon eggs, and we actually had to shoot one and get some, uh, some tissues. But that came out of that peregrine conference to make sure that, in fact, we were finding the same thing the British were, the Europeans were finding. Uh, and Sergey mentioned that there. Clayton, thanks. That's a great segue into some of the work that was done up in Canada. Our next speaker is David Hancock. And David Hancock has been a lecturer in Canada for years on eagles and other raptors. He's also the publisher of our Raptor Techniques book that we all, most of us have. And if you don't have it, you, there's copies back there that you can purchase. Hi, my name is David Hancock, Hancock Wildlife Foundation, Hancock House Publishers. What an honor to address the RRF conference on their 50th anniversary celebration of the Madison Peregrine Conference. I arrived at the Madison Peregrine Conference with Frank Beebe. At that time, I was a graduate student at UBC studying bald eagles. But I had been, between 1956 and 65, on seven trips to the Queen Charlotte Islands counting and collecting peregrines, six of these trips with Frank Beebe. Frank had been asked to give an updated report on the marine peregrines of the Northwest, Following up on his earlier publications, I accompanied him to Madison, as I had done to various early falconry meetings at Marlon Nelson's place, to the initiation of NAFA and the RRF. We had just got to the hotel and were preparing for supper when I got a call from Roland Clements, who I had known earlier from Bald Eagle meetings and giving talks for him in Florida. Would Frank and I join Roger Torrey Peterson and him for a drink? We accepted. The plate chat over, Roger directly asked Frank if his presentation was going to again show a strength in the breeding population of Northwest Peregrine. Frank jumped in with his normal enthusiasm of indeed the entire population was doing relatively well compared to what he was hearing from other people. Roger and Roland exchanged frowned looks. Instantly, Roland stated to Frank that certainly most of all the other studies were painting a bleak picture on peregrine reproduction around the world. Roland suggested to Frank that it would be better for the final conclusion of getting peregrines protected worldwide, and particularly in the U.S., if Frank's paper did not appear and present contradictions. Frank instantly jumped in to reiterate the discussions he and I had had before leaving Victoria. If most populations of peregrines were declining, but the population along the northwest coast of North America was not yet suffering, then this would add more data to the hypothesis that what was affecting most of the world's population was something else not found in our northern Pacific peregrines, another starting point. Roger jumped in directly, and he both and both he and Roland directly asked Frank to withdraw his paper. Frank simply said, why? The unpleasantness increased. Both Roger and Roland insisted Frank not deliver his paper. It would offer confusion, they insisted. Frank said he would give his paper. Frank neither agreed nor understood the politics. I suppose supported Frank in that his paper supported the big picture, that fra peregrine falcons were being negatively influenced by human activity and probably arising concerns of pesticides. Our, well, Frank's point was that there was no meaningful agriculture and industry on the northwest coast, but the two R's could not accept that as a positive. They did not want Frank's data out there needing explanation from already wrapped up conclusions, the reasons for funding the conference. Frank did not expect further comment, and to my knowledge, no further requests were made. Frank held no bad feelings. He would simply say his data stood the test and should be out there. Some press lurked in various hallways, and this controversy was not a desirable topic. This young biologist learned that science and good observations were only the beginning. Possibly, just possibly, with some effort and principle, they could prevail over politically directed agendas that said, to hell with science, Do dollars today 
are more important than living tomorrow. Perhaps rising waters suggest the youth of today have to learn this lesson again. Or is it that our profession does not speak loudly enough? I dedicate this to my mentor, Frank L. Beebe, one of the finest human beings I ever had the privilege to know. Thank you, David Hancock, Hancock Wildlife Foundation. We have only a little bit more time, but I would like to ask the panelists in a discussion <laughs> How do you help those that will follow behind you in our profession to conserve raptors? <laughs> Would you repeat the question? <laughs> You're addressing a whole bunch of youthful faces. What guidance can you give us? Spend more time in the field. <laughs> And I, when I Joe Hickey uh, visited Davis, I was detailed to show him a, a white-tailed kite, which he had never seen. It would be a lifer for him. And they were easily obtained and uh, e easily seen. And I took him out by the, what was called the field house on a Davis campus. We rounded the last corner. And there was not only uh, Joe's first uh, white-tailed kite, but his second as well. And the, and the second was one of, was atop the first. <laughs> he was thrilled. But he told me something as I took him around that day to, to look at birds. I don't know, it was a red tail or something, and, and um, I, I looked at it and put my binoculars down, and he said, you know, what you should really do, Steve, is watch that bird until it goes out of sight. And I always thought that was good. I don't know why. It's a kind of a nice idea. I mean, it, the, at the other extreme, people just see field marks. Um, and I've, I've used that uh, with my students over the years. I'd say the other one is do your homework. <laughs> yeah. And I think that you need to get involved in the political process and you need to elect people that are going to get together and work together and have a common goal. And that goal is to make this planet a livable place and not worry about growth and economics, and I think that if you get involved in politics, that's going to help, and get the right people in Congress. I, I, uh, I see things going to hell, <laughs> like the rest of you guys, and I, I think that um, that what is needed most is that mankind fall in love with nature like they fell in love with their gods. One of the Seattle Seahawks. <laughs> so a colleague of the panelists is Lloyd Kiff. Lloyd, do you have a question that you'd like to ask the panelists? I have the impression that there was no, by no means certainty about the implication of pesticides uh, in the decline of the peregrine going into the conference. But as Clay, or I'm sorry, Granger mentioned, Derek Ratcliffe, uh, near here in Sacramento, uh, it's Davis, told us that um, uh, in 85 that you all left with a common purpose. Uh, but did you personally, going in, did you have uncertainty about pesticides and, and, and peregrines? Are you asking me? All of you. Oh, yeah. We had uncertainty about everything. In fact, in fact, you know, one of the, the uh, uh, East German, and this was in the height of the Cold War, and one of the East Germans that gave a, a paper there said it was sonic booms from the air base, the American air base in East Berlin that was causing eggshells egg to break. So there were all kinds of hypotheses, that, and, and a lot of them were politically motivated rather than actually what true science was showing. What about you, Dan? <coughs> of course, you were there with Joe. I have one other uh, point here to make and then I'll answer your question, but I think I would add enjoy work and life and have fun doing it. As Joe Hickey did. Right, exactly. Um, what was the question? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> did, did, you sp spent your life working on the uh, toxicological topics. Uh, where, where, where was your head when uh, 
the conference that's coming I together. Was, I was all pr um, pretty much influenced by Rachel Carson by then, and I, uh, I was pretty much on board already <coughs> before. And I just getting started as a graduate student, basically, with Joe Hickey. Mm -hmm. I was nothing more than a grad student. But <laughs> may, may I ask Dan a, a question? Tell us, Dan, about the sequence of I events in, in Derek Ratcliffe. Did he, did he tell Joe about the eggshell thinning thing long before? I mean, w did that precipitate your research? Uh, this was um, kind of an interesting thing, but, but I, Joe and Derek were pretty close, and he left, Derek left the Congress, or conference, with this idea that he's got a, f just like everybody else, and he went to see this guy, D. Nettersole Thompson, the egg collector, and the guy suggested, why don't you go look at the eggs? And he went, and he didn't have a uh, device to measure thickness, so he devised an index. Which was length times breadth, breadth divided, divided by weight. Divided by weight. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, he was on, uh, he and Joe were in touch a lot, and they were plotting and scheming. and. Then with Joe, I, Lucille Stickle also had a big influence on me. And uh, she was, I was interested in pharmacodynamics and, and modeling the uptake of, of contaminants and chemicals in the, in the bird's body. And I wanted to do some of that too, and Joe wanted me to go do the eggshell work. And so I ended up getting to do both actually. And that was the other thing about Joe. He would be, I wanted to do those things and he let me do them. Another question, um, <coughs> which relates to also uh, Lloyd. It's interesting that when Derek Ratcliffe went, uh, went round to, to measure these uh, eggshells, he got, um, I don't know how much data, but some data from illegal collections. I wonder if you, had the same experience in the in North America. All kinds of that. <laughs> Little. I had to uh, get confidence. A lot of illegal collectors um, trusted me mainly because they trusted Joe, and I was working for Joe. But I also, Joe used to call me the confidence man. I'd go out and, and, and get into these, and 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 Lucille, we discussed this. I wrote this in a little essay that I never published, but um, Joe and Lucille Stickle, when we were going, they were gonna send me out to all these museums. Uh, I told them that I was getting, I was finding a lot of illegal activity and, and them being Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, or Lucille, told me that you have to keep your confidences. Because it was a little bit of a dilemma for me. I'm finding out a lot of things here that I, don't really feel comfortable with. And so I kept it all inside, you know, inside. Huh. I'd like to thank all of time. you. We're out of time. Dan, would you like to say another comment? Yes, go, please, Dan. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, follow up with the uh, number of colleagues that I neglected to mention who uh, I was involved with in subsequent uh, peregrine research in the Arctic, uh, namely Jim Anderson, Skip Walker, James Weaver, and um, I'm probably leaving a few out. Most importantly, uh, Chuck Sindelar, who did the three-month survey with me in the eastern states where we covered 14,000 miles and we got along fine. <laughs> <laughs> As our profession moves forward, we truly stand on the shoulders of giants. Thank you all.